this week's episode of Tribal Research Specialists, the podcast. A podcast about tribal people, our communities, and discussions on research traditions. We aim to uncover the true meaning of research methodological approaches that are currently operating in tribal life, with implications for tribal communities and avenues for knowledge production. One of these mystery mystery tracks from uh, this collection of reel to reels again from that was gifted to my mom from Larry Parker, and um, it sounds like um, to me that song sounds like uh, like the old old Red album, the old Red Bull Red tape. You know, you know what I'm talking about. It kind of has this um, this sound that is reminiscent of that uh, that particular uh, style. Now, I don't know. I don't know for sure. Um, but I would hope that someone listening would say, oh, yeah, that's um, that's these guys. And it was recorded around this time. I don't know. We haven't had anybody do that yet. I'm always hopeful that somebody will. But they haven't. But, you know, what's important about this? Um, I think this uh, going along this path right here is... Uh, you know, the, the telling of stories or the sharing of information and experiences, it, uh, it can reveal some knowledge that we may or may not know that might be based in fact, might be based on, uh, you know, some experience of some person. So the, I, can, I think the sharing of these mystery, these, the, these mystery reels hopefully will illustrate or uh, not illustrate, but, um, um, bring to light where these recordings may have been uh, recorded. And I think one of the challenges today, one of the challenges today in this uh, idea of all these tribes sharing knowledge and sharing this uh, information around is that, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to, to understand each other in a different way. Um, but w- there's always complications, it seems. And I think um, this idea of native journalism I think really helps us to share on a wider audience and a wider platform. Um, but I think there's also some complications in that. Even when did we you say, that, did, what? did you say wider or whiter? What? Wider. W I D. What? White. Wide. Wider. Wide. <laughs> as, okay. uh, Go ahead. Okay, as in a, okay. As in a shape, not a color. Wider. Okay, I, what was I saying? Okay, yeah, so uh, even when I say the word native journalism, I mean, I, I, in a way, I'm a little, a little confused because my view or my experience with native journalism has been um, uh, somewhat, um, I don't know, I wouldn't say skewed, but I have an experience, and we talked about it at the end of the last episode, which should be a... Uh, um, or at the end of the last episode, we talked about this idea of censorship. So um, this is what this was my understanding, or this is kind of what my experience is. You have uh, these tribal newspapers, and the editors or the reporters or whoever they are, they have to engage in a level of self censorship. Cen- Let me try it again. Censorship. 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 Censor. Sensor, sensor, like sensei, like sensei. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna self censor myself right now, and I'm from the talk. Greek, from the from the from the Greek <laughs> word of sensi, which means to smell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna Google that, and I'm gonna uh, discredit you right off the bat. No, um, okay. So he's trying to censor me. So you need to self censor. 
I shouldn't have to censor you. So this is what I'm Self. talking about. Self-censor. <laughs> is this, is this, this is what I'm wondering. This is what I'm wondering. And this is the question. Is self-censorship, is this a type of traditional value? So for example, um, do should we remain sensitive to uh, it, it, internal criticism for fear of uh, showing weakness externally? I don't know what that means. Ah, oh, come on. Okay, let me let me say this. So should we say um, not say that maybe our tribal government's not doing so great in a journalistic sense to avoid showing weakness among uh, a group of other tribal folks we want everybody to know that we're doing great we don't want to know we don't want people to know our internal conflicts so as to increase our standing or our uh, stature among tribes copy no still not coming in I get no the, no what, what? Could, okay because then that that turns that turns from credible journalism to propaganda okay and then but who's defining credible journalism yeah it's not indians yeah well wow, you just got really radical <laughs> well you just went to the extreme in are, my are, experience okay this, this is luella talking in my experience yeah um most if not all natives who have embraced the idea of of like journalism in its pure form okay are you know how do i want to say this without sounding like a radical 70s it, huh? indian but they are they were radical 70s indians right yeah. that's when this this era of of uh pure journalism for well, i mean for they grew their braids back so started. that was something they 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 started the the For that time period, what, what became the Native American Journalism Association or the Gen Native American Journalists Association that started in the seventies that grew okay. out of that that movement of you know taking back our culture and taking back our identities as Native people yeah and it it all it's all rooted in that time frame of yeah. telling our own stories right good or bad. With we tell our own stories. Yeah. In that era of, of activism when it started to, you know, gain root in our communities strongly, you know, journalism, it it comes along with that activism. There's always journalism been storytellers okay. with change making. There's okay. they come, they come, they yeah. exist together. Right. And so, you know. I feel like I've been blessed to to kind of come up in the world of journalism, knowing those some some of those people who were there in that era, and those people mentored me and helped me grow in my profession and in my skill set, and the mentality that I have when it comes to my work as a journalist is directly influenced by you know, their spirit and their their understanding of what journalism is. Right. 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 And so most people who take their role seriously as Native journalists are not propagandists. Okay. Okay. Did you use the word propagandist? I did. Propagandist. Did you like that? That's awesome. <laughs> hey, you know, okay. I get that. I get it. I get it. And, you know, we have a we have a, um, a a rich audience. I mean, a rich set of guests here today with Luella's help to bring some folks in some uh, uh, some journalists who have some experience who might might also want to chime in on this. And I'm really interested. And I'm yeah. really curious. We have two guests. today. So let's. Oh, yeah. Take it over. Let me introduce. Let me introduce our two guests, because I think that. Now some remember of their not, credentials. Okay, this is some not of their like credentials. I think are important to know. Okay, well, this isn't so, like. Okay, this isn't we're, like. We're not okay. gonna this is, go. <laughs> Sandy, we're letter not letter. gonna go into like this realm of like twenty minutes of introductions. No, but I think it's important to know that. Okay. Um, You're Lori right. Edmo has worked, um, for the Showbend News for twenty three years. That's a when, long time. When it comes to tribal journalism and yeah. um, native media, she has seen it all. Yes. Um, 
she has worked in many non tribal media outlets yeah. as well. Yes. Um, so she has a, a rich and diverse resume. I would agree. I would agree. Uh, a wealth of experience. Yes, definitely. And, and, and then, um, oh, yeah, go ahead. So she's going to bring a lot of different and interesting stories to the podcast. And then we have Dalton Walker, yeah. who is a national correspondent for Indian Country Today in its yeah. newest form, which is an online yeah national online platform so um dalton has worked for tribal media as well as mainstream media um he's done tons of work he came up in the kind of my generation of native journalism Lori is like one generation behind us so he's the myspace generation yes we (laughs) were rocking myspace so we have two different perspectives i think um, on the issues so let's bring on both of our guests and maybe they could tell us a little <laughs> bit about themselves and what well, i think that yeah the the question the question yeah. i'm wondering what their thoughts are on this this rambling i just uh, spouted off <laughs> i don't know if it made sense but i want to know i want to know well for me i'm not a propagandist And I've always believed in my work is that our tribal people have the right to know what's going on within our, within our tribal government and our community. And, and I've always believed that. And oftentimes I've gotten into trouble and I've been fired twice. And most recently it was last September, no October, but I got my job back and Both times I got my job back, but pretty crazy. And it's not an easy position to be in. And and it's right now I'm so burned out on a be working in a hostile work environment that I'm ready to change my profession. Wow. Which is unfortunate. But to me, I need peace in my life. And you know, I've done what I need to and and yeah. although I do believe I, I'd like to keep telling our stories, but yeah. at some point you have to decide when it's enough or to have some peace. Right. And I think that I think part of that that experience of being able to tell the truth and to be supported in that, I think that I think that's something I, we all strive for in, in the things that we do. And so it's it's not a surprise when we get into any profession. And we're limited in what we can and can't do. That becomes a, it becomes quite the struggle. But I think it's important what you said. We all have the right to know, and I think research and journalism work work in in different ways, but very similar ways to to do that. Um, the the difference I think, or one of the constraining factors in that right to know, is again who who controls that right. And a lot of times there are constraints on that. What do you think about that, Dalton? What is it? What is your what is your take on it? Well, I was getting my hopes up there. I thought she was going to be bringing back MySpace and we were going to start a <laughs> MySpace tribal newspaper and I was all set to go. <laughs> That'd be awesome. When, Get your when I started back out, out. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. When when I started out as Lula was, Lula was saying. I thought the, the most I could do are the most impact I would have would be working in the mainstream industry. Um, at the time, I thought travel journalism just wasn't for me. Like I thought maybe I could reach more people to that extent. Maybe I could help young indigenous people break through. The more I go, the more I bring with them type of mindset. Um, so I, I did that for a few years and I had a good time and learned a lot and um, did my best. But it always felt something inside me that how come I'm not doing this for people that look like me? How come I'm not doing this for the the youth that look up to me to think I'm doing something good? And a few years ago, I had an opportunity to kind of go back to that with um, a tribal publication. And I was, and I'm based in Phoenix and it worked out because one of the Phoenix Valley 
tribe, Salt River, had an opening as, as a manager for their newspaper. Hmm. And when I got there, I quickly learned some of the limitations we had as a tribal government-owned entity yeah. and what our expectations were. And initially, I didn't really push back because at the same time, you have to think about, well, there's a lot of stories to tell. We have to keep an eye on the newsmakers. We have to keep an eye on what's happening. We have a school district inside. We have a tribal government. How far can I push the envelope when it comes to stories that some might see as maybe controversial or a topic that the tribal government will not like? So there was a heck of a balance I had to have. And I, and for me, the part that I was kind of worried about was I wasn't from here. Like uh-huh. I, 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 I learned a lot. I met people, I talked to people and I try to get as comfortable as I could. I did have the connection as an indigenous person. So we did have that and I didn't meet great people, made friends and great mm-hmm. sources. So that was an obstacle too. And second, Another obstacle was balance. Um, uh, I, should we do something that could jeopardize our job, our income, yeah. that maybe could be drawn out and might not even turn? There was always those type of things. So it wasn't like A to B, oh, I'm going to get this and this is going to be righteous and great. Yeah. There was always so much in between. Yeah. So everything had to be turned in and at the same time there are so many stories out there so many feature stories so much happening yeah that i i don't want to say fortunate but we didn't really have to face that issue um from the from the tribal government at least my brief time there hmm interesting interesting yeah you know um I think you you um you talk about this idea of um you know where where you're most impactful you know whether I should be housing my ideas and my passion into mainstream to I guess um do work in that way or whether I should be inside the tribal community doing work in uh among that audience and um I think one of the challenges that we we face uh um both in research and journalism is this idea of um, uh, again, this, this censorship or this um, uh, you have to dance around topics that people think are overly sensitive, which is, can be a carryover from the days of uh, of oppression, you know, and, and I don't know if you experience that in journalism where something is so sensitive that you can't talk about it because you'll, you'll upset people because they think that um, you're opening the door to something that other people should not know about. And that was kind of what I was getting at about this idea of self censor censorship, you know, in our work, no matter what we do, we have to decide the topic and we have to decide if it's going to be meaningful for the community. But then we also have to look at our society as a whole, our tribal societies, and say, is this something that's just for us? Or is this something that's also for um, the the average uh, audience to consume? And so, you know, we apply a self-censor in a way. And I'm wondering, um, in your guys' experience, uh, to what to what degree do you apply that sensitivity? Well, for me because I work in my own community, you know, my own tribe and I work among our tribal people, then I really, I think in sometimes in some instances, for example, when there's tragedy or violence that might've occurred in the community, especially like a murder or, or a, a standoff or something like that, then sometimes, you know, I really have to consider, you know, how it's going to impact the families and, uh, for example, we had a triple murder a number of years ago that was drug related, and and uh, unlike a lot of the non-native journalists, then uh, you know I I always believe it's important to let the families grieve and not be right in their face to ask questions or comments or you know want to demand a comment right away, and uh, 
oftentimes I leave it up to them if they want, you know, to come forward and say something and, or else I'll ask them, you know, I'll message them or text or see if they, they want to say anything. And so in those instances, I think it's a matter of respect, having right. respect for your own people and, and give them the time they need to, to, to grieve. Because I had a, uh, my brother, he passed away a number of years ago and, uh, he died, you know, it wasn't a, uh, nothing to that the cops were involved or anything. And mm-hmm. he died from cirrhosis, but mm. the news media was calling my mom's house because he was at my cousin's house where they, we found where he was found and, and they kept bugging my mom, wanting her to comment and mm. whether or not it was a, a suspicious situation. And finally, I just had to tell them, you know, that, you know, this just to back off and let give us time to be because it wasn't something that, you know, it wasn't related to a suspicious death or anything. And so yeah. that was difficult. So a lot of times you just have to have some respect and back off and let, let them have time to grieve. And right. then we had another instance where there was a question about uh, a ceremony that we do. And uh, uh, a woman who was a Miss Indian world and she wanted to do this ceremony at the gathering of nations and, you know, it's not something that we do for yeah. the then the non in public or anybody else. We do it here. And yeah. so that became a big controversy and it caused a lot of uh discussion and hmm. conflict in the community. So it became p- before our Native American church board who, you know, who addresses these things and also yeah. our culture committee. And to me, I felt like that was a situation that needed to be kept within our community and within our tribe because there was a lot of conflict over it and I listened to all the perspectives on it and yeah I chose not to write about it because it was a real sensitive subject and it was I think that all the discussion that occurred within those meetings and the community mm-hmm. you know within our people ourselves was was good and yeah. it you know it helped um you know help people get it out of their system and give their perspectives but I felt like it was something that shouldn't be written about although I had all the information and could have and Mm -hmm. then they ended up doing it anyway but they uh, wrote about it no they ended up having the oh gathering of nations so it was just a big controversy and that was one that I think I guess could be referred to as self-censorship right 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 yeah uh Dalton do, do, do you Do you have any uh, experience in a similar way? Because I I hear a common theme coming up, and and I'll I'll, I'll follow up with that, unless Lou has something else. But Dalton, do do you have a follow-up on it? Um, Self-censorship? I can think of a few things while at this tribal media that came up in my journalism hat, partly because I had worked in in mainstream journalism for roughly – eight years prior so i felt my news judgment was 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 one of my strengths and there was some things that happened that i wondered why we didn't do and i would i would go i would ask my supervisor kind of what's our our, how 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 we approach this and you can kind of see sometimes that the the topic um was touchy and this topic was related to gaming um the tribe i worked for um was able to provide gaming revenue for um its citizens and they had a big and there was something happened to the casino and i was like why aren't we reporting on this so and i was getting ready to start but then my supervisor said no let's wait let's let's just wait so we kind of sat on it Mm-hmm. And then we just really never came back to that beyond what the gaming casino told us. So it wasn't, yeah. I didn't do, I didn't do any journalism per se on this topic. And I did get some people out reaching out to me and asking me like, Hey, what's going on? Why haven't you guys done anything? Yeah. And that kind of fell on me. Like how much do I pursue this? And I go back to that. Well, I love. I like this job. It's fun. It's great. I'm. I'm making a paycheck. Do I really want to get in trouble? Do I really want to? 
be on thin ice with my employer by pushing back. Yeah. So there was some definitely, and, there, and I can think of maybe a couple other scenarios like that. And yeah, but it was, it was minimal in a bigger picture. Um, I think the quality of journalism we did during my time there was pretty good, but yeah, yeah there were some misses and a lot of it fell on the people who made the decisions that were above me. Right. Right. Aaron, I see you looking pensive. I see you. I, there's something brewing up there. And Luella, too. I, they, this is this is the least I've heard Luella and Aaron talk. What's up, man? Well, did you say pensive? Pensive, yes. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I have so many examples I want to talk about. Mike Pensive? Mike Pence. If... <laughs> Oh, I want to hear it. Let's hear Lou's oh, yeah, example. Yeah, I want to hear what she has to say. Oh, she's rubbing her hands together. All right. It's going to get... Okay, so... <laughs> like a villain. Like yeah. an evil villain. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. some of my examples are because I'm a tribal member, but some of them are because I cover small communi- a small community. Yeah. Um, Our sheriff is a tribal member. And when I first started at the paper, one of his children died in a car accident. And I wasn't sure how to handle it. And so I talked to my my publisher at the time and I, I said, I think we need to write about it, but I don't think I should be the one to write about it because I felt really disrespectful asking him about his, you know, his dead kid right. you know, the day after she died. Like right. it puts me in an awkward position. Um because not only because he's a tribal member, but because when, you know, when I was a kid, he was one of our neighbors <laughs> and um, like, I know him. Yeah. Um, and he's like, okay, well, I'll try to get a hold of him. So that kind of took me out of the equation. Um, but we couldn't get a hold of him anyway, because he doesn't like us. <laughs> um, and then <laughs> when the whole... <laughs> That's yeah. a whole different story. Whole I kind of want to hear that one. <laughs> That's an interesting Sounds story. familiar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's had he's had beef with the paper since forever ago. Um, since one of his first terms, he's had several terms. Um, but then when the whole um thing happened with Selena Not Afraid, um, that was really difficult for me to cover, not only because she was so young when she went missing and subsequently was found dead yeah but she was in the same class as my boys in Mm. middle school Mm. and um my one of my boys just was having a really difficult time with it right and Mm. um every time we heard a rumor or you know something this or something that it was just like oh my god you know i it wasn't and, and, you know, in, as journalists, we're, we're pretty dark anyway. And <laughs> it's sad to say that we get excited when there's crime news and car chases and yeah. potential investigations that we get to follow and court cases. And yeah, but this was so hard. This one was so difficult. And then um, they had a um, memorial when she was found so we went up my son wanted to go up to Billings to the rims and go to the memorial so we went and I was like well maybe I'll get some pictures so you know I snapped a couple pictures and then I was like ah I'm not gonna work I'm I'm not working anymore yeah and I just had yeah. to be a person you know I just had to be a human being and uh-huh. there, there are a lot of situations like that where you just you have to stop and you just you have to be a person right and it they seem to be it seems to happen more now that i'm covering my own community uh uh-huh. like the times i have to stop and just be a human yeah occur more now because these aren't like when i when i when i was working in missoula or great falls it was just like oh la la no, they're just human robots you know they're just uh-huh. pegs on a on a board cribbage but yeah but here they're people they're like relatives and friends and 
the children yeah. of my classmates mm -hmm. and um okay sarah stops at pretty places you know that i grew up with her with her mom and aunties you know they're related yeah. to me and um Henny Scott, you know, they she went missing and was found dead. Um, uh -huh. I grew up with her stepdad. He was always at our house. Um, they're not just numbers. They're not just cases. So it's like you have to take a step back. Some details you don't want to report because you're too close to it. Not yeah. because the community is too close to it, but you're too close to it. Right. Um, we had a... <laughs> There was an incident at the fair, at the 4-H fair. Um, one of the grandparents of one of the kids who was showing animals at the fair um, convinced one of the organizers to let him in. The fair was kind of like sh shut down to the public because uh -huh. of COVID. Yeah. And only people who lived in the household with the children who were showing animals could go. Uh -huh. And this guy was a grandparent and he didn't live in the same house. So he couldn't yeah. go. But he convinced the organizer to let him go because it was his last grandchild who would be in the fair. Uh -huh. and, oh my goodness, you know, it was culture and heritage, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. Um that so he, she's <laughs> like, Well, you have to wear your mask. Kind of a big thing, well, but <laughs> you, I mean you have to wear your mask. And so he puts she his sounded, mask. On. She sounded like the guy on old brother. That's exactly it. Um, <laughs> our, our culture and heritage. Yeah. So he puts his mask on. He goes and sits down and they start the pig show, which is my favorite show at the fair because I've learned a lot since oh. my boys started FFA. <laughs> and um, the his little piggies show. are running around the ring and he takes his mask off. This is devolving. Okay. All right. All right. I'm going to stick with it. No, listen. Okay. It gets, it gets so much better. He takes right. his mask off. And one of the other organizers is like, hey, that guy took his mask off. You might want to go talk to him. And they, it was like under strict orders from the health board. The only way they were going to let this fair go on was if everyone had a mask on. So they stopped the and whole so fair. So the original organizer who let him in went and confronted him and said, hey, you need to put a mask on. And he refused. Uh huh. And it started kind of a yelling and screaming thing. Yeah. And she said, well, if you're not going to comply, you need to leave. And so him and his wife stormed out. And then he got into his truck and he said, it's people like you. Oh, people like you are the reason we carry guns in this country. <laughs> Jeez. And then he said, um, you'd be sorry if I had my gun right now or something to that effect. <laughs> okay. And then he reversed his truck about 25 feet and then put it in drive and went right for her and turned at the last oh. minute and hit her with the side view mirror. Huh. So they called the cops and this woman's in a tizzy and her co-organizers in a tizzy and they call the cops he ends up getting charged with um misdemeanor assault and yeah. disorderly conduct yeah and um he is the majority owner of a bank in town okay so two days later they have the livestock sale at the fair uh-huh and both of my boys are selling a pig and a steer and guess who buys one of my boys' steers. Tell that me. Bank that he owns. Okay. So <laughs> I I was like, hmm. Well, then I found out that at the health board meeting, they had a, a special health board meeting to discuss this incident. Yeah. And the the chairman of the health board meeting told the health board that this man is the kind of bully that we cannot allow in this county. His actions need to have consequences and um, blah, 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 blah. So the bank that he owns rescinded a several hundred thousand dollar donation that they had pledged to the hospital that the health board chair works at. Uh huh. They're doing a capital campaign to remodel the hospital yeah and that bank is like mm, well if you're gonna act like that we're gonna take our money back uh-huh so i think to myself 
my kid's supposed to get $5,500 from this bank. They had no trouble pulling all their hundred thousands of dollars away from a hospital. Yeah. Just for being, you know, making a comment in a health board meeting that wasn't public. Uh Uh-huh. If I wrote a story about this man's actions and Uh, the charges that are pending. Yeah. I do not doubt that they would pull the money from the fair. Right. So we sat on the story till the check cleared from the fair. Uh Uh-huh. Because I didn't think it would be fair for my kid to not get paid for all that hard work just because we wrote a story. Right. So, I mean, and that's just small town politics. Yeah, I was going to say that's that's I mean, that that happens. And that's one of the hard things. Yeah, that's one of the hard things about working for a small town paper. Everybody knows everybody and they all know everyone else. Right. Um. But you kind of it all it's all about the that balance of, you know, should we run this now? Should we run it next week? Should we cover this now or should we wait till it actually goes to trial or, you know, all of that? Is it going to go to a plea agreement? Because if it's going to go to a plea agreement, maybe we should just wait till that happens. Um, It's kind of hard. And. My motto, you know, as a journalist is if everybody's happy with your coverage, you're not doing your job right. Half of the town (laughs) should be pissed off at you because you covered it. And the other half of the town should be pissed off at you because you didn't cover something. Right. right? Everyone at all times should be mad at you if you're doing a good job. Yeah. Um, So I'm used to it. Everyone's always pissed at me. So that's fine. Means (laughs) at least I'm doing my job. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well that's interesting in in a lot of ways because it, it kind of goes against the idea of the guarantee of freedom of press i don't know maybe you know where, where we're trying to emphasize you know this idea of freedom of expression you know within i guess of course some certain limits you know you can't be obscene you can't slander people those kind of things but especially in uh, in indian country you know the, the theme that it, that came up last on that last episode and today is this idea of reporting on death. It seems to be a sensitive or at least a unique topic for native journalists, but then also this idea of reporting on very private matters or things that are held uh, held uh, very sensitive in the tribe, like a ceremonialism. So death and ceremonialism seem to not have a place or have a, a, an a obscure place in uh, native journalism. And um, I'm wondering if this is a unique marker or a, of tribal journalism, or is this something you also see in mainstream? I, I don't know. You know, I co- we covered a car wreck um, in August 2019, a beat truck. The kid was texting uh-huh. and there he was going around a curve and he actually went into the wrong lane as he, he went into the inside lane as he was turning on the curve. And he plowed into a car and the two people in the front of that car died. And the person in the back was severely injured and um, it caused a big old fire in a field. Uh And that car was thrown into that field. And then that's what started the fire and his truck rolled into the ditch. And we got a photo of kind of the wreckage afterward. Yeah. There was no blood. There were no bodies. There was no cops on the scene. There was no police tape, nothing. It was just two wrecks in the black field. Yeah. And we put it on a small-ish photo on the bottom of the front page. And the community was outraged. Yeah. Outraged because we were so disrespectful because two people died. Mm-hmm. Um, they were non-natives. So mm-hmm. I went back into two years worth of newspapers and there were 15 stories with photos about car wrecks on the front page of the paper. They were all natives Mm -hmm. and there was not a single phone call or email about those stories. Hmm. So Hmm. I guess it just depends sometimes on the color of the people in the car wrecks. I would suppose, I would suppose that's, um, 
yeah, that I mean, it's not surprising, not surprising to the to the, in the least. But I'm wondering, um, our guests, what what are your thoughts on that? Well, I want to say one quick thing. Yeah, I want to say how much I admire Lori and Lu- Luella for what they're doing and what they what they do now because this is their readership are people they see all the time right. and to do cover stuff in the age of social media can be really scary people can find people share so much stuff and yeah. people know how to navigate it so well that almost everything is out there so you might think you do something great or a great story moment it goes up moment it's published you might get something some slander against you for whatever reason and it's hard to take that and i can t- and i and i imagine it's that much more when you work with people you see or you know your cousins cousins all this type of thing so i just want to throw that out that i really admire Lori and Lola for what the work they've done and the work they continue to do mm. mm-hmm. i think that's the hardest thing is uh a lot of your relatives are what you have to you know, who you have to write about. And uh, mm. we had a situation where there was a, a murder and, uh, and and both of them were related to me, the alleged suspect and then the one who was murdered. And so when I got the grand jury report then, and I had a heck of a time getting it, then it was really hard to decide, you know, what needs to be told and what doesn't because it was so grisly. And it was, we were just, you know, fortunate that more people weren't killed because it was, one of them was just out of his mind on drugs and, yeah. and he was just shooting. And so, you know, I think that's really hard to do that. And then we had another instance where uh, this uh, white guy, he was a construction worker working out here on the res and he went and murdered his girlfriend. And then ended up burying her at that construction site and they were looking for her body and, and they Mm. found it there. And so, you know, I wrote a story about it and put it on our Facebook page. And why was that ever something I had to monitor? Because the comments were just, a lot Mm. of the comments were just racist. And, and so it was, it's really difficult to try to uh, police those kind of things, especially when you write something controversial on yeah. your Facebook page because it's like a 24 hour a deal. You yeah. got to just keep an eye on it and it's hard. And sometimes I debate whether or not I should put it up, put <laughs> it up or not. But then on the other hand, it's in the interest of public safety. You know, our people have a right to know what's going on and they want to know. And in some yeah. ways, you know, they get used to it. And then if we don't immediately report something, then they get mad. So you know, it's kind of like you constantly, you know, some, like Luella said, somebody's always going to be mad at you. So, yeah. but, you know, you just have to keep hanging in there and try to do the best you can. But sometimes it can be really wearing. And I'd imagine when you, it's, but, you know, it's just a matter of doing your job. Yeah. Yeah. The, the job has to be done. And it seems like just from mm-hmm. what uh, what the message I'm hearing is you kind of have to be controversial or, I mean, you can't just play to the happy stories. Um, you have to play to what's really unfolding in the community, which is which is always a mix of everything. So I can imagine that uh, that's going to be a pretty tough job. Um, but I, I don't know. It just it it brings up a lot of questions for me. Um, really trying to understand um, like the purpose, what the, the purpose of, of journalism and especially native journalism, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a, a little bit confused by the work that we have to do or the work that we want to do. And then some of the constraints that we find in that. And it's very similar to research. You know, we, we, we have to uh, monitor what we research and what we don't research based on some external factors and and i don't like that i don't i don't really like that but i think we have to hold to some particular values and i'm wondering this is the question of of uh i, I was trying to get um out in the last episode is the the set of values that you adhere to from your profession and from 
you 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 as a native person how do those things coincide or or are they very conflicting if you know what i mean well i think i'm really fortunate that i got a pretty good education in journalism uh-huh. because i started out at the university of oregon with their school of journalism and i got some really good things that were just ground into me right. in terms of uh what's right and what's wrong and then I transferred to the University of Montana and that's where I graduated from. But I think uh-huh. having a really good foundation for, for uh, journalistic principles really makes a difference. And then right. also I'm fortunate that I have tribal elders who, have, who are really strong and they've taught me a lot about our culture and right. traditions and, and our Diniwap or Tinichu, even that means our tribal teachings. And so right. I use that as a foundation for, you know, what I do with my work and, and things like that. And if I have questions or if I have, you know, any doubt, then I'll go to them to, you know, find out, you know, when my grandma, she really kept me in place when she was (laughs) alive. And I'm thankful for that. Yeah. Because she, you know, she made me think about things and I really appreciate that. And my mom too, I could always go to her and she's gone now, but you yeah. know, it's really important to have a good foundation and and have strong people behind you who who you can, you know, reflect back on or, or yeah. who taught you a good foundation. Yes. Yeah, pretty important. Pretty important. You know, this is a good time. Let's take a little breather here. Let's do a little intermission and then we'll get back to this. Cause there's I have another I have I have some I have a lot of questions. I have a lot of questions. And um, hopefully I can drag some answers out of people. You guys ready? <laughs> you guys ready to get drug? <laughs> Take a drag it's out drug. of the pipe of knowledge? This is another song off that same reel. I think it's the same folks singing around. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew more about it. Um, some good tunes, some really good tunes on these, uh, these mystery tapes here. And um, the fact that you can't, uh, or you, that I don't know who they are, we got to try to take some clues by the, the style of the, of the singing the beat of the drum, even kind of the background noise, you kind of get some clues on where, uh, where these, this, uh, tune might be from. And, um, you know, really in the work that, uh, kind of the work that we do, Aaron and, and I, and, and others, you know, we, we try to compile all the evidence we can into a, into a story that will hopefully share, um, or, or, uh, transmit some knowledge forward. Uh, one of the questions, I guess, or one of the um, one of the hallmarks of, uh, I suppose, science, in a way, is that they the the philosophy of science says it's it's um, free of bias, free of the researcher's own um, uh, thoughts and opinions, and the data that's collected should reflect that. Aaron, do you think you're colorblind? Are you colorblind? To the things that you do? No. No. You're definitely see color in the yeah. work you do. I yeah. mean, you have to. And I'm biased. Yeah. We've gone down this road and we've talked about it. The 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 ability to remain unbiased in our work, that seems impossible, right? 
I mean, I suppose if we were studying uh, microbes in Antarctica, I don't know. Maybe they wouldn't. We wouldn't bring so much of our own bias. I, I don't know. I don't know. Microbes and I don't know. Let's let's get a let's get a drag off the pipe of knowledge. <laughs> I can't believe that came out of my mouth. <laughs> I, I I can. You can. I yeah I can. That's, yeah, I can. I've heard you say weirder things, man. That's, uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, one time we were all at a movie and there were bo- it was like Blade Two, and there were boxes and it had Blade. like Chinese writing, and you convinced us that it translated to Tasty Moo Cow. <laughs> I don't remember Bunch of that. Dumb kids were like, "Oh, really? How do you know how to read Japanese?" Ah, <laughs> uh, crepes. Yeah, I don't remember that. I think it's a. I think you just fabricated that story. No, nope, I was it. there. You were there. There was like four of us there. <laughs> Tasty moo cow. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I don't know. Color blindness. We can't be. I don't think native journalism. I mean, Luella threw down the professional professionalism card on the last ap- episode and said, "No, we adhere to strict professional I- code of conduct." Yeah. Okay. I call BS on now that though. I, I do too. <laughs> I do too. We do try too. our Ooh. hardest. I try so hard to be unbiased. Why though? Because it's not my job to interpret what's going on in the world. But I just tell uh, about no, what's going on in the world. But that's all. That's all journalism is. Is is no? That's what interpret- TV journalism is. That's what Tucker Carlson is. No, he's just a doofus in a tie. I'm telling you, <laughs> we're all doofuses. So the all all, all, no. all that you're doing. TV journalists are not journalists. Yeah. <laughs> and TV news anchors, they just read the newspaper. I tell you and how all, I know because when I interned in Seattle, all, all they read one of my stories word for word. All print journalism do is read Facebook. No, we don't. <laughs> we scroll Facebook and then we call the sources. <laughs> I just think that I think I think there's been this kind of indoctrinated attitude in journalism that they're somehow unbiased, and that native journalism have bought into this idea that that uh, this this notion of journalism is this kind of patriotic duty when in fact your job is to serve a community and the needs of a community. Now our needs in native country is different than that of the United States. So what, what, what is news to some people isn't news to us. And I don't understand the need for journalism to try to be a round peg in a square hole. Right. But what what are you assuming that native journalists cover that is not useful? Most of it. Like what? <laughs> like I'm just, crime? I'm just messing like, with you. Like what? Well, well, okay. Dalton, you were gonna say something. Don't just mess with me, bro. Dalton. <laughs> Dalton. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna mention. Um, he, someone mentioned the uh, Facebook. Yeah. Um, face. No, I, and for me, Facebook is a real reporting tool, as in, for two reasons. One, it's kind of, it's like, it's gossip, but we check it out. Like we'll uh, say, like, we might see something, might hear something, but we're not going to say, oh, because of Facebook, we're going to give somebody a call, we're going to talk about it. It's kind of like the um, the auntie back in the res used to call us and tell us certain things they heard. It's basically the same <laughs> type of rep- reporting. Yeah. Like, you're not going to take it for verbatim. But there might be something there for us to look into that right. might turn into a story. At least that's what the the good one, the good the good journalists can do. Right. Well, I, and if they'll be on the record, be on, yeah, yeah, if they'll go on the record. I mean, uh, I've got a lot of stuff off of social media. I don't, I don't say um, social media is it's not my primary source. It's like when you're trying desperately trying to find something and you go to wikipedia and then you click on the source and it takes you to the bottom where they got it then you go there and then you go to the actual source and then you go from the actual source to find like the academic documents and then you go there (laughs) it's like that when you know when you're doing research and you're just desperate to figure something out and then you you follow the web all the way around that's that facebook is like a starting point 
Well, like, I find out about all the high speed chases on Facebook. Yeah, oh, yeah. the high speed chases. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, or the yeah. house Facebook, fires. <laughs> Facebook has also have been kind of up and down, as in it's been an outlook for tribal governments or our tribal leaders or somebody who has a connection to any country to say what they want to say the way they want to say it. Yeah. Where that wasn't the case decade or so ago. So they have yeah. that where, where if I want something from someone, but they have a, fa- a quote Facebook statement, they'll just say, well, I said it on Facebook. I'm not going to bother talking to you because they said what they wanted to say yeah. already. So it's good that it's out there, but at the same time yeah. it's not because then, you're not going to get that one-on-one time sometimes. Well, right. just like Hardin School District, they put all of their press releases on Facebook and they won't email anything to me. Huh. So, you guys are just confirming what I said. It's, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I just I well, don't know okay. why there was a uproar when I said it. Well, it doesn't make sense. Like, you guys I get just it. exhibit A, exhibit B. Exhibit, can I call <laughs> to the court exhibit A? You basically you said no, that's not what we do. And then the last five minutes has been giving me examples of no, doing just we're that. Not, we're, we're saying that there are different levels of usefulness to the social media platforms. I didn't right. change. But we still have to verify. I didn't yeah, attach yeah. a level. But we still have level. to verify. We verify. still have to verify. Can we? Just the journalists will verify. Can we agree though that most news is just commentary? No. Even print. No. <laughs> it's all commentary. No. We got two no. no's. We got well, two. Okay. No. The, the, Aaron. I'm just saying it because it has to be said. Aaron, <laughs> you're right. Well, no, I, I agree with Aaron. What do you read and, the opinion page and I, I, uh, watch Tucker Carlson? <laughs> I don't know who Tucker Carlson is. I, I thought you were talking about a guy from Browning when you first said it. I don't know who <laughs> Tucker Carlson is. <laughs> I've never even heard oh, yeah. his name. He won state then basketball. Yeah, and, and yeah he was a state he, champion. He, 96. Yeah, I don't. Channel. I don't really An watch. The, district I, player. I don't really watch the news. I kind of I turn it on just because the weather lady's name is Majestic Storm, and our daughter loves to watch Majestic Storm do the weather. <laughs> I just okay. think it's crazy okay. that our weather well, lady's name is Majestic Storm. That's not her real name. It is. No, it's not. She changed it. I worked with a hydrologist real, named though. Steve Flood. So it can happen. That's not his real name either. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's, wait a minute. Okay, your conversation okay. point is um is interesting because it kind of talks it calls on what's been happening the last four four or five plus years where there's a distrust with people and news organizations. Yeah. It didn't help that the last four years the media was basically wailed on by people in charge at a national level so yeah and also a lot of people don't understand what journalism is and i don't want to say that's their fault that's kind of part of journalism to explain what that is and then there's a lot of interpretation too Uh and there's a lot of different outlets so there is so much going on and honestly i think a lot of people just don't care they want to find their agenda they want to find what what works for them and how that makes sense to them. And it doesn't matter if it's credible or not. They're just going to go down that rabbit hole. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of the fight we have right now is um, hmm. you want to be credible. You want to be accurate. You want to be able to tell a story that hmm. has journalism beliefs. See that, Luke? So Did you that, see that? The, the, that's how you argue. How Dalton did that? <laughs> he shot me down. He shot everything I said down, and I'm not offended one bit. That, there you go. Okay, so I want to I want to insert something here because I I I I was feeling Aaron's passion. I was feeling it, but I don't know if I quite understood what what he was because they got in this little sibling shouting match, well, which was of, pretty cool of, to capture. You know, <laughs> that uh, was pretty awesome. Most of what I said. Um, I was just saying it to make Lou mad. Um, <laughs> but I, I mean, it comes from somewhere. I'm definitely guilty of not trusting the news. I think okay. I've learned to support my sister's work, but I don't yeah. s- typically support journalism. And I'm guilty of that. That's my that's on me. And because right. of my own whatever. Um, and plus, 
there always has been this, and I'm just going to say it. Okay. I'll say it. Hey, There's always hey. been this rift between like, researchers especially in the social sciences and journalism and how there's been certain standards placed on us as yeah. documenters of social behavior yeah. but those same standards are not placed on journalism which is essentially right. the same thing but in the now right and yeah i've always been like well why why do we have to go through all this work like if we want to interview someone but they don't so yeah in fact, you were in a meeting one time when I said, well, why don't we just call what we do? What did I say? Ethnojournalism or something Ethno like that? Ethnojournalism, yeah. 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 yeah, And the lady was like, what? I confused her. So under the yeah. national standards of the law, we have to follow the in Institutional Review Board, which under the, under the law, it says um, there's a thing called the common rule. What the common rule is like. Uh, kind of the guidelines to how we we set what our protocols like if we apply for to do research right and this is all yeah. because of the have a soup by and all that but under yeah. what's exempt from the common rule is journalism yeah which me as an ethnographer that's all i am right i'm just a historic right, right. journalist i mean yeah i just look and at so events and i talk to people about them you know so I never quite understood why that standard was placed on me, but not on journalists. Yeah, that's an important I just one. To piss my sister off. Oh, yeah, that's easy to do. Sounds like very volatile. It, it's easy. <laughs> it just took two little comments, but let me let me walk back because I want to read. I want to come back to what and you then, just and said. And then here. Lori and Dalton supported what I said when I threw the Facebook comment out there. Not Boom. at first, though. Not at first. I got what I, don't I wanted, know. though. I don't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you made some rage happen. This is the thing, I, and I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to what Aaron just said, but I want to come. I want. I had two two things that I wanted to mention, and this is this is kind of what I picked up on Aaron's first message about, you know, really what is what is the purpose of journalism, and so I go back to Lori's story about um, this ceremony that these people were trying to do that gathering of nations and there was this whole community uproar. I don't know if that's the right word, but there was this, this dialogue. Now that's the kind of stuff I'd be interested in reading about, but we don't, we don't report on that. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I was like, that would actually be a cool story. Not the story of the be. ceremony, but of the controversy of it. Yeah. Like, because those are day-to-day -day problems in Indian country. Like people yeah. have those questions. Like yeah. we want to know stuff like that. So, yeah. Oh, I, I was going to go off, but go ahead. No, no, go off. Cause that, that I think that's where I, I wanted to reinsert what you're saying about this difference between research and journalism, because uh, we, we could report on that and get some really good advancement of knowledge on internal structures of tribal ways um, without, you know, with being still being sensitive to things that we don't want but see, yeah. all of all of that stuff is still who defines that? Who defines what sensitive right. is? Who defines even what events should be placed in the paper? The only thing yeah. I can come up with is, is time. The only difference between what I do and what my sister does is time. Yeah. I wait right. 40 years before the story is important to me. Right. Where she, she's well, 40 minutes for her or whatever, you know, for journalism. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, we ended up. We did end up reporting on it being oh, good. held at gathering. And oh. there was some issue with our reporter because she went there and um, she was not wanting to, you know, wanting us to show photos of it because of the controversy. But I said, uh, but it happened. So yeah. we have to. And right. so we have to report on it. So we did. Yeah. So, and, you know, it wasn't a major part of the story, but. We still, you know, printed photos and and yeah. uh, said that it happened. So, yeah. but you know, the whole other part that was behind the scenes that happened prior to it, you know, that was something that I chose not to write yeah. a story about previous to it. Right, and 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 it seemed like there's something that that holds us back from doing those things, whether we feel compelled to do it or not, and it it, it drives me back to the idea of of ethics and, and the virtues that we hold 
So a lot of times those are guided by external forces, which which are, is common in, in tribal groups, right? So we, we get pressured yeah. not, not to do something. Because, well, for me, it was just a matter of respect for our, yeah. for our elders that, and, and, and going to these meetings because it was really sensitive. And I heard all sides. And, you know, to me, it was out of respect to them on, on uh, what their beliefs were. Right. And to me, that was why I decided you know, what I did. And, you yeah. know, I don't have any regrets. Yeah. 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 Although people probably question that, but you know, that was what I decided. And in talking with some people, then that was what I decided. Yeah. I mean, we face those kind of, those kind of things every day. I think, you know, we, we, we get guided by our, by our community because we want to, we want to encourage this, this sense of cooperation you know, we're, we're in a tribal group and we want to be, you don't want to be the person like who said it, uh, uh, the, the, the person that nobody likes, especially if you're a journalist, if you're, if you're a native journalist and you're notorious in the community for not being liked, you're not going to be able to get a lot, a whole lot of news, it seems like. And so to, to maintain that balance of, um, of, of uh, being influenced by your community and then being uh, influenced by your professional pursuit to to um, cover all the news colorblind and and uh, undefined by external pressures it, that, that seems like to be a pretty tough job especially in Indian Indian country I don't know I don't know if that's you feel if this is mainstream media people feel that same way I want I, I the I want the record to reflect though that Lou pet Pet, was petting a cat for roughly four minutes straight like she didn't <laughs> she didn't and now you notice her demeanors changed so i made her mad she picked up a cat and she, animal she comforted herself and i want to applaud you for that lou i'm proud of that's you a, sister that's a great I'm proud self of you. instead of self instead help. of Instead of be combative, you weren't combative as you like in our childhood. You just wait till you get here. You like in our wait. in our childhood, she's very wait. combative, and in this case, she said, "You know what? Smell the roses, blow out the candles, and good for you." <laughs> you good know, people you. who talk like that have spent a lot of time in therapy, so I applaud you as well. <laughs> I just, but I do want to say something podcast related thank you okay okay um, reel it in i can't remember now we're oh, all she related can't remember we're all related. <laughs> oh okay so here it is there's a flying cat by my head okay um so i have this brother that came to me with a wonderful story idea yeah about um how covid was causing the tribe to lose a lot of culture keepers and language right. keepers right and um, I thought it would be a great story, but I thought the timing wasn't great because we had just lost one of them, like like the two days before or something. Yeah. And I was like, oh, how am I going to navigate this? Because I, I'm definitely one of those people who has a hard time going up to a family and saying hey you just lost someone how does that make you feel and then you know taking notes in their face i hate doing that right um i've lost a lot of stories to that you know hmm. i've got a story about the sheriff the gazette the gazette swam in here and got a story about the sheriff losing his daughter hmm. in a car wreck mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the family of selena gave right. a big story to the gazette the another there's a couple more incidences where the gazette has no shame you know they'll come in and talk to a grieving family sobbing and crying and yeah. oh, how does that make you feel you know which is one of the things you learn in journalism school don't do that uh -huh. um but you know it is what it is um but the way i was raised the the cultural teachings that i hold uh -huh. um you don't do that to right. people you don't ah jump right in their grills yeah. um so i thought to myself how are we going to get this a story like this because mm -hmm. everyone involved in the telling of that story would be grieving family members 
Um, mm-hmm. So I got one of my former reporters and asked him, you know, hey, do you think you could do this in an appropriate way? And he was like, oh, sure. Because um, he kn- knew all of those families and he said he thinks he could, he thought he could do it. Um, so he asked them, you know, when do you think we could get together and talk about, you know, your loved one who passed because we are, we want to write the story about how COVID has, you know, taken so many of our culture keepers and none of them were ready mm-hmm. because I mean, in our County, we've lost 67 people. Well, 68, I just got a press release yesterday. Um, but within yeah. our tribe, it's well over 70 part of our reservation is not in Bighorn County and yeah. then off reservation people have brought us well over 70. Um, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of families. Yeah. That's, you know, some of them, it took a couple of days. Some of them, it took, you know, as long as five or six weeks. Um, but it is tragic and it is, it is, it's not like, like the, the grief that comes with this COVID is not like anything I've been. Uh-huh. Um, and it's really overwhelming for our community. And so none of these families are ready to talk. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, when they're ready, they'll be ready. No, the Gazette ran a huge, huge full page with a jump about one of these people who wasn't ready. The family wasn't ready, but the Gazette mm. ran a full page article with photos and a jump. Mm. Um, I don't know how they talked to the family if they weren't ready. Um, but to me, that says maybe I value things more than my readership does. Mm. Maybe I'm being overly sensitive to hmm. my community's needs because that's not the first and it's not going to be the last time that I right. lose a story to another news outlet because I'm being too respectful right. of my readership. Right. Um, but, you know, I would rather err on the side of caution right. than offend someone in that type of situation. Right. Um, well, it seems like, you know, it seems like the, our um our societies are changing so rapidly and maybe it's just because i'm getting older and maybe more aware but you know we we have to be fluid in in the things we do we have to be fluid in in our professions you know like aaron saying 40 years from now that's the story or, or whatever but you know things change are changing uh you know intergenerationally very very quickly and um for native journalism, for native research, for anything to keep up with the, the changing trends, I, I think is, can be challenging. Um, so, you know, where, where our values um, uh, respond to those, I'm, I'm, you know, I think, I, I don't know how much they should change. You know, like you're saying, maybe I should be less sensitive to, to, uh, to death because it's an important thing, especially with, you know, this wave of suicides that happened, this wave of the missing and murdered women, this wave of COVID deaths, you know, we, we, you have a responsibility to report on that. Researchers have a responsibility to research that, you know, but we're all trying to do it from a, a native angle or from a tribal perspective. And so when, when in all of that, does, does, uh, do our tribals value change or do our tribal values adapt to responding to that or not? Because we we have this we, and we have this always in our face. It's always in our face everywhere you look about decolonizing, de- decolonizing things, post-colonial mission of of whatever you insert whatever you want in there, and it and it's and I don't know what purpose that serves really when when we're unable to really evaluate our own value systems, and to see if our practices are still based in those. And to know if our practices are still uh, meeting the needs of our community. I like to say yes. I like to think, yeah, I think it is. But when we adhere to some professional code that maybe doesn't align with that, I, I, I don't know. 
and and I'm guilty of it myself. All of us going through Western education, we have to think, are we overly influenced by our profession and are not inserting enough of our own values and ethics into that to do our job better for our communities? I don't know. Somebody say something about that. Ready? Go. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think it's important that, um, well, I know that I've taught my kids well that, yeah. you know, I they pretty much follow whatever, you know, I've done. I mean, yeah. they're really strong in their beliefs and they're strong in their teachings and, yeah. and uh, they pretty much understand where I come from and yeah. why I do the things I do, but. And I try to explain to our staff too here that, you know, why it's important to have some respect for and uh, ethically, you know, do things right and yeah, and try to teach them as best as I can. But, you know, they each have their own, you know, teachings too and their beliefs. And, but mm-hmm. I just try to explain, you know, why things are the way they are, but also hear their perspectives too. So I'm always open to hearing other yeah. perspectives and, and knowing where they're coming from. So hopefully that, that creates a balance. Yeah, definitely. Open and willing to listen. That's really yeah, important and, value. And then I'm always learning, you know, yeah. being here this long and as old as I am, you know, I still learn things, something all the time, especially yeah. technologically, because I learn from my staff. Yeah. D- Dalton, what, what what say you in that regard with that diatribe that I delivered through the microphone, from the pipe of knowledge, go. <laughs> well, I think what you what you explained make makes sense, and I right. think it always falls on on perspective. Um, mm-hmm. One one I, one thing that caught my my thoughts initially was um, with the pandemic, kind of flipped all flipped us all on our head to some mm-hmm. degree, some worse, some less. And it's also affecting tribal governments right? and decision makers and leaders. Like there's a window now for a restart of some kind. Ah, yes. It'll be interesting to, it'll be interesting to see when you talk about should this, this type of format, this type of structure, should we continue to do that? Should we start something different? Mm. And maybe that will happen. There's a lot of tribal governments out there. There's a lot of native people out there. So you can't say yeah. all native people are doing this or not. But um, it will be interesting to see what happens moving forward as we kind of gauge this new normal. And it's going to be different yeah. for everybody. You know, this will be kind of really interesting to see what happens. That's interesting. That is. I, I wouldn't have thought about it that way. But yes. Aaron, Luella, i seen you stew. I seen a glimmer of disagreement or agreement. I want the I want the record to reflect that Luella spent two minutes lathering her <laughs> her uh, and moisturizing during the podcast straight. So Ke- was it? Carol? It was not two minutes. I just put lotion on my hands. They're real dry. The Jergens? No, or was it was. It? What is it? Burt's B. What? I don't know. It's this. Can, I got it can in I, the box. Can I, can I see? I just want the listeners okay. to know. I just want the listeners to know that Luella is applying self care. That's good. Self care is important during these difficult That's times. Good. So I'll say something, and then I got to get going. So yeah, um, so we're gonna wrap right after Luella gives her response. Go ahead, you go. Well, I want to thank Lori and Dalton for being on the for sure on on the pod. The, uh, <laughs> terse. <laughs> yeah, on the pod. The um, uh, and again, I want to appreciate. I appreciate Sean Dean's uh, vocabulary. It's uh, <laughs> quite extensive. But I, I, um, I want people to know that some of what I said was just kind of in. I was just messing around. I definitely value journalism, but some of it was just to get my sister all riled up. But um, <laughs> uh, I. I I think journalism, and all joking aside, is one of the most valuable tools that people have, especially reliable journalism. For me, man, it seems like it's getting harder and harder to come by. So, yeah. but what I would like to see, and I haven't seen all Native 
newspapers or print journalism. It's just more like not to be afraid to embrace their biases on being tribal. Like yeah. as a tribal person, I've never read a paper that to me was like scream native. So I want, I would like to see that one day and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. So yeah, I challenge all of you be biased. <laughs> be biased. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. thanks again, Laurie. Thank you very much, Dalton. Thank you very much. But um, I'll let Luella. No, actually, what I'm gonna do is wait for Lou to talk, and then I'm gonna interrupt her real quick. Oh yeah, do that first. I don't know why. So I'm gonna do this right now. <laughs> I don't know why you're so mean to me. I am the best so, older sister ever. I, I want you guys to know this about my sister. She was always the quickest. And always had uh, the strongest vocabulary out of the uh, uh, my brothers and sisters and, and my cousins that my mother raised. So Lou was the only person I knew that could not, she wouldn't yell, but she could just cut you down with her words. <laughs> and you would like feel like defeated. So <laughs> this little bit that I have, this little bit this that tiny I... Tiny little victory. This tiny little, I hold dear... <laughs> to myself i i'm gonna hold it because i've always been very afraid of luella <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she might be the most intellectual person i know which is intimidating because um i can't win an argument with her because i'm scared of her so and he I'm owes on. me 25 percent of his master's thesis Oh, yeah. There's that. I too. edited it. She was my editor for my thesis, um, but I'm 400 miles brain. away from her right now. So I'm going to talk smack. And, yeah, it hurt my uh, brain so hard. <laughs> but anyway, thanks again. Uh, I'm going to mute my mic and I'll shut up. But thank you guys, Lori, Dalton, and Luella. This isn't over. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh okay so what are we talking about i don't even know <laughs> i lost it i lost it i, I lost, lost it. it well how about I just do... uh, let's let's do this let's do this you wrap us up with this thought um and okay. this is one of this is one of the last questions i wanted to ask and it's not extensive but really i, I want to know since i'm surrounded by these esteemed highly decorated Native journalists, I want to know what's what's the future? What is the future of native journalism? G given some of the things I said, you know, my lack of knowledge of of the profession, um, but I'm I'm definitely a consumer of native media in my own way. But what is the future? What what do you see pushing the boundaries of your profession, and especially of your own? Um, um, cultural view on where we need to go with native journalism i think really the future of native journalism is treating every story like local news um and really getting that kind of um the feeling of close proximity you know there there's always there's a difference when you read a national news story and a local news story. And, the, and there's a reason that local news outlets are read more than national news. There's a reason that these bigger newspapers are failing at a higher rate than local news outlets. And that's because people trust their local newspaper. Hmm. Um, if native journalism is going to survive through these trying times, as people <laughs> like to say, um, we need to start treating native news as local news. Um, I think that in a country today is doing an amazing job at that very thing. I think the way they're covering national news in a way that makes it feel like local news Mm -hmm. pulls the readers in hmm. and the way that they connect these national issues with kind of local voices helps 
people mm. understand things on a on like a human level and not on a on a news level. Right. Um, they have coverage up in Alaska and from DC to California, you know? Right. Um, all in one place. They do obituaries. You can submit obituaries. Mm -hmm. Um, like your local newspaper. Um, mm. and I think that type of format for an online paper, you know, is is the way to go. I think that that type of you know that presentation mm -hmm. is the future. And then you know they have their their newscasts like yeah with Patty, which I I absolutely just love her news anchor voice. I do <laughs> love it. I can't perfect mine. Um, <laughs> but I think these the the small tribal papers need to embrace the technology that's available. And right. I think having podcasts and video and you know updated websites, I think <laughs> are gonna push <laughs> tribal papers into you know the next decade. Yeah. And, if tribal papers are going to go independent, they need to have a better presentation to mm -hmm. attract advertisers. Yeah. So that's what I think. And um, just, you know, coverage, coverage, coverage. That's all it is, you know, having the best coverage, having diverse coverage of your community. Yeah. You know, it's all about the meat. You know, right. you can present it as beautiful as beautiful as you want to, but mm -hmm. you need to have something. Got to be substance. some protein on there. Yep. <laughs> and that, I mean, I think everyone would agree that there needs to be substance. Yeah. You can have all the style you want, but you have to have substance. Right. Yep. Well, Lori, what what are your thoughts? Final thought. What's the well, I what? Think, I think that storytelling is part of our culture that native journalism will always be be here. But like Luella says, you know, we do have to keep up with the changing times and technology is really important. I mean, we've had to, you know, we we do a lot of videos and, and we're looking into doing podcasts. So, hmm. but it takes money, you know, and that's right. something that uh, we're pretty limited, but we we're pretty, we're pretty frugal with our spending and but when we do need to make a purchase we do and we do fundraising so it's made a big difference but a lot of it too with with us in terms of a tribal publication is our tribal leaders need to understand that it's important to to have our publication because you know not everybody has internet access or smartphones and a good majority of our people rely on the newspaper for their news and so that's why we continue. And, you know, we believe in our people. We believe in our culture. And, you know, that's a big part of our coverage, too. So, mm. and to me, it's important to share our stories and tell their stories. Because uh, who else is going to do it? You know, right. and our treaty rights. You know, and it, it's just really important to carry on. And that's what I try to instill into our, in our people and our, and our staff. And they know it. They firmly believe in it. Right. Those are some pretty important things, you know, going forward. Uh, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, I didn't get to everything I wanted to talk about. So I think hopefully we'll, down the road, we'll return back to this topic, uh, especially this idea about the the difference between research and journalism in, in Indian country, you know such a struggle for for native researchers to to research the things we want to or need to and still um be within the ethical guidelines so i think there's more to explore there but man i thank you guys for um taking the time out to tell us your experiences and your um some of the challenges and successes that you have and um hopefully that we can um we can report back and and get some details on the work you've done uh, in the future and um, see how things are going. Any, anything, any last words there, Luella? You think we're good? You think we got it? I think we're good. You think I we're think good? we had a good time. Did yeah. we have a good time? 
What was the what was the, what did I say? Yeah. What did the box say? What did the box say? The popcorn box? It was a box of frozen food and it said tasty moo cow in Japanese. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> Blade two. We watched Blade yeah. Two. Bazula. <laughs> tasty moo. I think cow. it was you, me, and Salisha and Shane. I believe it. I believe it. Yep. Well, good thanks times, again. Good times. Thanks again, Lori, and then uh, we'll Thank talk. We'll, hopefully, we'll we'll get in touch soon. Okay. All righty, we're done. Okay. All right. Thank you for joining us on this episode. And if you want to learn more about what we're up to, go ahead and search Tribal Research Specialists in Twitter. Facebook or YouTube and uh, check out our other sites. And uh, if you want to contribute to the show, go ahead and look us up on Patreon. We would appreciate your donations.